In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. First, a little apology I always give at Requiems. Why do we wear black? Because we're mourning the death of a loved one. And mourning is healthy. To deny the need to mourn will cause another level of mourning in us later that's unhealthy. So we wear black to remind ourselves it's healthy to mourn the loss of a loved one. Black is a sign that this is so. Thus, many of you are wearing black today, too. That is fitting. Also, black reminds us that Marie has, in fact, died. And her body lies here before us. And she still may need our prayers. From the track today, we heard this. Absolve, O Lord, the souls of the faithful departed from every bond of sin. And by the help of thy grace... May they be enabled to escape the avenging judgment and enjoy the blessedness of light eternal. His Majesty, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, gave us his famous Sermon on the Mount. We find it starting with the Beatitudes in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. To obtain the kingdom of heaven is to have Beatitude. The face-to-face vision of God Almighty. His majesty then goes on throughout the sermon to tell us what is required to become poor in spirit. In a word, order. Order. Some examples. You have heard that it was said unto them of old, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. You have heard that it was said of them of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you that whosoever shall look on a woman to lust after her hath already committed adultery with her in his heart. You have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, do good to them that hate you, and pray to them that persecute and calumniate you, that you may be the children of your Father who is in heaven. Words of our Lord, and they show he does not want any disorder in our souls. Not disorder of anger, not disorder of lust, not disorder of hatred. Thus he proclaims, be ye therefore perfect as also your heavenly Father is perfect. And he says, Seek ye therefore first the kingdom of God and its justice, and all these things shall be added unto you. To seek God and its justice is to seek order. To be poor in spirit is to humbly embrace and conform ourselves to this order in its entirety. Because in God and his heaven, there is perfect ordering. And to be with him in heaven, this perfect ordering is required of all his saints. Heaven is the land of order. It's the land of harmony and unity. No division there. Thus, St. John says in the Apocalypse, the last book of the Bible, there shall not enter into it, into heaven, anything defiled or that worketh abomination, or maketh a lie. This is the same as saying, there shall not enter into heaven anything perverted, anything disordered, anything divisive. Heaven is the home of order. And to enter, one's soul must have all disorder removed. Now, as many here are aware, maybe some more than others, Marie Marie, whose body lies here before us, dedicated herself, especially in her later years, to restore order in her soul. Something that she neglected in her earlier years, and she deeply regretted. Having come out of Egypt again, she had been baptized, but she went back. And she came back again, and she re-entered the desert of penance in order to enter the promised land. She worked hard at embracing the law of God in its entirety, even establishing a little rule for herself, for her daily life, to make this more possible. 
In Latin, the word for rule is regula. Regula. From which we get regular. We become regular in having a regula, in seeking an ordered life. Thus, she prayed frequently. She read good books. She went to frequent confession, went to frequently to Mass. She listened to good sermons. She regulated many other things as well, like clothing and diet, as I'm sure you're aware. Unless I'm mistaking, many here felt these efforts of hers too, as she tended to let her zealous efforts spill over into the lives of those around her. Striving to undo past mistakes, but we should be edified by her sincere intentions and actions to reestablish godly order in herself and in the world around her. And in some way, we might say, would that we were a little more zealous. Now, since few are able to perfect this godly order in their souls before death comes, this inner harmony, God provides a way for this to be reestablished and all disorder to be atoned for even after death. Thus, there is a purgatory for those dying in the good graces of God, and more frightening, there's a hell for those who do not. But in both places, in both places, order is reestablished and reparation is made for past perversions. And the one place it's temporal and the other it's eternal. It does not end. Listen to the 16th century mystic St. Catherine of Genoa. Speak about purgatory and the need for purgation. She says, as for paradise, God has placed no doors there. Whoever wishes to enter does so. The all merciful God stands there with his arms open, waiting to receive us into his glory. I also see, however, that the divine essence is so pure so light-filled, we might add, so ordered, harmonious, perfect. Much more than we can imagine, she says, that the soul that has but the slightest imperfection would rather throw itself into a thousand hells than appear thus before the divine presence. The slightest imperfection would rather throw itself into a thousand hells than to, to appear before God. Thank you, St. Catherine. For the poorer souls in purgatory, then, it is not the suffering that is the most painful thing, but rather that something in them is disordered. Something in them is abhorred by love itself. And this causes them great consternation. Again, listen to St. Catherine of Genoa. Such impediments are the cause of the suffering of the souls in purgatory. Not that those souls dwell on their suffering. They dwell rather on the resistance they feel in themselves against the will of God. Against his intense and pure love bent on nothing but drawing them up to himself. Do we feel this way about our faults? About our past mistakes and faults and sins? our disordered self-love, our self-indulgence. St. Catherine points out over and over that the souls in purgatory feel great joy in one thing, that they are now doing the will of God. Thus she says, what he wills for them is what gives them joy. It is our conviction that Marie did indeed die in the good graces of God having received the sacraments the day before she died, including the apostolic pardon. She lived an ordered life, but she very well may be in need, a great need of assistance to finish the work of reestablishing God's perfect order in her soul, such that she is truly poor in spirit, happily inheriting the kingdom of heaven, the promised land. Let us then, dearly beloved, assist Marie by praying for her and having masses offered for her 
praying our rosaries for her, praying the stations for her, lighting candles for her. As St. Ephraim said, 4th century, doctor of the church. I beseech you, my brethren and friends, in the name of God, who commands me to leave you, to remember me when you assemble to pray. Do not bury me with perfumes. Give them not to me, but to God. Me, conceived in sorrows, bury with lamentations, and instead of perfumes, assist me with your prayers. For the dead are benefited by the prayers of living saints. Eternal rest grant unto her, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon her. And may her soul and all the souls of the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen.